This Les Paul brings Blues Lawyer to a whole new extreme. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. We're over on the Live Auctioneers website, and I am absolutely gutted I missed out on this unique one-of-one 90s Gibson Les Paul. I was kind of hoping this thing would fall under the radar, but of course people bid it up at the end. So let's go ahead and take a look at this thing. We've got a very unique headstock. It says Custom Shop Les Paul, and those are real Mother of Pearl banners on the headstock. It's really big and gaudy. You gotta remember, the first custom shop as we think of it today opened in late 1993. And generally you see this banner in the very late 90s, most iconically on the Les Paul Elegant series, the one that came right after the Catalinas. They were chambered out just like the Bantam Les Pauls and the Florentines except for they didn't have the F-holes and gone were the exotic solid colors. And now we have these beautiful, crazy flame maple tops, sometimes even quilty, and elegants even infused abalone into their inlay work. But only the first few years got this really gaudy custom shop thing because they eventually did away with it for a regular Les Paul model silkscreen. But the other thing that makes this headstock unique is the fact that we've got a single band of binding going all around it. Sometimes you'd find this on like the Ultimas of the late 90s. So since we've got the binding, it can't be an elegant. Is it some sort of an art guitar? My friends, brace yourselves. Look at this thing. It's a lawsuit waiting to happen. And trust me, that's going to get way funnier the further we dig into this. This actually appears to potentially be a flat top Les Paul, but they have this metal engraved graphic over top of it that's just screwed onto the top. You can actually see the screws exposed over here. But I like the fact that we actually do have a single band of binding around the body as well. Now, Les Paul shape, screwed on metal engraved graphic. Huh, what does that remind you of? Zomitis guitars. They are well known for having these decorative plates over top of their instruments. And that company has a long standing history of doing things like this. So that's why when I saw this one show up from the 90s, Gibson kind of playing from their books. I wanted to try to win this to document it because it's just so crazy. And it looks like we've got some really special knobs going on as well. This is something you probably have to appreciate in person. I mean, that looks just like cloth. That's how finely laser etched and engraved that was. But we also have the engraving of our pickup covers over here. You've got some flowers or something. Now sometimes you can find the art guitars, they also do that on the tailpiece and the ABR1 bridge, but it doesn't look like they went that far on this particular one. But it looks like the entire backside of this was just black, but it almost looks like we've got some sort of a black sparkle finish back here, or maybe it's just reflecting the light in a different way. But if we're being honest here, this guitar kind of looks tacky in my opinion. It's not my favorite, outside of being a cool period piece. But how do we know Gibson wasn't just trying to be fancy? How do we know they were really going after Zomitis? Look at your fretboard on this. It's dot inlays. Exactly what the Zomitis does. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot deny that they weren't copying someone else's playbook while designing this. Now, Gibson later went on to do the New Century series, which has the mirror pit guard on it, which is very similar to this. It's just not quite as pretty. But you want to know what makes this even better? Let's take a look at our serial number. It says JK001. Just kidding, number one. Is this some sort of an April Fool's joke? No, that's actually the initials of someone. And that someone's name is right here on the truss rod cover. Joel Katz. Now you might be thinking, Joel Katz, Joel Katz, have I ever heard any of his music? No, that is actually the name of a lawyer. I looked him up on the internet and found his website over here. He seems like a nice guy, but apparently he's a pretty influential contributor that likes to participate in the entertainment industry and helps facilitate corporate acquisitions and mergers, as well as do some consulting work among many of other things, I'm sure. I mean, you can go ahead and read through this whole paragraph. I don't have to read to you, but he was voted lawyer of the year in 2014 and 2020 and was nominated as one of the best lawyers in America for quite some years in a row. He must have did something really good for Gibson in the legal department that they wanted to make him a nice gift. So that's right, all those memes about blues lawyer guitars, this is an official lawyer signature Gibson guitar copying someone else's stuff. <laughs> it's just hilarious to me. Now I'm not really pointing fingers here or anything. Obviously he liked the Zizmidas design and he didn't actually work with that company, so he asked Gibson to make him this special piece. So how do we know any of this story was true? Well, it was Joel Katz selling off some of his items within this auction, so it came directly from the guy. 
So I was really hoping I could pick this thing up for like 3500 bucks and then just keep it forever because that'd be cool. But unfortunately, it got bid all the way up to 6500 and he got a 25% buyer's premium on top of that. And after you add in their handling fees and shipping, we'll call that a cool round 500, it went for about 8600 bucks. Which if I had to put a value on this, if you were just wanting to sit it on reverb and wait for the right guy, I think it probably could fetch between 10 and 12000 if you gave it enough time. But sadly, I had to let it go because I've got a lot of other guitars I'd rather buy at this point, but that is certainly a special piece. So there you go. Cool late 90s history from the Henry J era. Gotta love the early custom shop days. They were so adventurous and risk-taking. It's always exciting to see new models. But there were also a few other cool Les Pauls. So this one, I just clicked on it, Ace Fraley Budokan. We had just talked about these not too long ago. This appears to be from the 300 run, which is the initial late 90s version. But oh my goodness, I didn't realize... This was from Les Paul's estate, and the pick guard is signed by Ace to Les. And it was serial number one? Oh my goodness, this thing sold for a paltry sum. Somebody got really lucky on that. Wow. Why was that not in the title, live auctioneers? I would have wanted to have been on that. And even these guys thought it'd be like 30 to 50k, which is probably what it is worth. Ouch, that really hurts. That initially sold for 16,250 at the actual Les Paul auction. And that was back in 2012. There's literally no reason that couldn't have brought at least $22,500. Somebody got seriously lucky. I don't know if I want to look through these other listings. I'm scared of what else I might have missed out on. But the show must go on. Here's a mid-90s signature Jimmy Page Les Paul. I haven't seen these on reverb as often as I used to. It's the first Jimmy Page model. It's just Gibson USA, but they had all his fancy electronics on here. They came with these sweet green interior cases. I love those. And it's got the upgraded, like, Les Paul Supreme style handle, you know, before the Supreme was a thing. I guess another good example would be the Georges St. Pierre guitars. They came with a similar case that you can see and learn all about in this episode with my gold paisley version. But it looks like this one needs a little bit of a cleaning up and it's got the typical lacquer lines around the Gibson logo, but that's all right. But what's not all right is the nut has been replaced. Ouch. And it's definitely been played. I'm surprised. From this photo, I thought that thing would be like unplayed mint condition. I mean, who actually leaves that plastic thing on? That's nice that they still have that. And ooh, it looks like we're using a Fender bullet string just for our high. E string. Some pretty cool wood grain and finish checking on this one. But that one got bid up to 4800 Our next one was bid to 3000 but this is kind of a cool anniversary model. This is not a white SG that's aged yellow, it just kind of started this really yellow color. And the late 80s, early 90s SG customs in the 61 62 style are really good guitars. They used to be relatively inexpensive as compared to modern day custom shops. Unfortunately, asking prices have rose, but the 30th anniversary was kind of cool, but honestly kind of lame at the same time. It just says 30th anniversary, 1961, 1991. I mean, it's better than the 30th anniversary gold tops from the 80s that have it on one inlay on the fretboard. So this is kind of one of those guitars that I guess I might need one in my collection. I'm not sure if I'm collecting SGs or not outside of like Guitar of the Week and stuff. But that one was in fine condition. It's got the case. It's got the candy. Sometimes this place does get some pretty nice stuff. But that was not a bad price at all. But what do we got going on here? Something that was only supposed to sell between 10 and 15,000 brought 25 five grand i think we looked at this the last time and i was curious how much it would sell for so they thought it was a late 50s or early 60s les paul got a whole bunch of replaced parts and whatnot and looking at it yeah that's definitely not a factory bigsby you've probably got your stop bar studs underneath the custom made plaque pickups may or may not be original knobs are looking okay yeah that's definitely 50s reissues don't quite look that good yet needs a little bit of a cleaning and oh wow you still have the pafs in there i thought for sure those had been replaced but oh, there's the kicker. It's a stolen guitar. It was stolen at some point in time. Whether it was recovered or not, I guess we can't really verify. It's bad mojo owning a guitar that doesn't have a serial number, especially when it's been obviously tampered with like that one. There is no accident in the world that you can make up a story for of only erasing those digits. So I think these are normally going for like, what, 50, 60,000? 25,000 if you don't mind. The bad juju doesn't seem too bad. But speaking of bad juju, live auctioneers, shame on you guys. Shame on you. You scammed somebody out of 3,600 bucks. That's a bad fake. That's not even a good one. The body is all wonky. And you can't tell me that these guys haven't had other Les Pauls to know something's up. If you purchase this, please 
seek a refund because that is a Chinese counterfeit. Well, what's really strange here is the starting price was 900 bucks, and then it just all of a sudden jumps up to 3600 without any other biddings. I wonder if somebody put that in to make sure somebody didn't buy it. All I've got to say is, hey, live auctioneers, if you're watching this, you guys need to reach out to this guy and give him his money back. Because this wasn't the only fake in this auction. They had this one listed as a Les Paul custom guitar as well. Now, thankfully, this one didn't sell for that much, only 1100 But no, that's a fake Gibson as well. They're always really smushed looking down here. They don't have the correct bell shape. Usually the custom emblems are just way too small. They're the Epiphone style rather than the Gibson. This one, not only is it small, it's also shifted too far down the headstock. All the fakes always use 2005-ish serial numbers. You can tell that's not a good quality rosewood fretboard, and the inlays aren't quite the exact right shape. Doesn't look like we have the fret nibs, but it's not the worst looking fretboard I've ever seen. But then you've got your metric bridge over here. But again, that's not always the case. Sometimes people put Tone Pros on and then you get that. Now granted, it actually looks pretty good. I don't think I've actually seen a fake flame top SG before. It's like they're going after the SG Elegance. But you guys got to be careful buying cases aftermarket as well on reverb. I see this all the time. People listing these fake Gibson cases. Here's the easiest telltale sign is the giant handle right here. Thankfully, those were the only two fakes I saw, but I was kind of scared from this one. And maybe people didn't bid as much because they saw the other fakes and they were worried about this. But once you zoom in on the photos, everything's great on this one. Honestly, just looking at it, I would probably say it's a 76 ish due to the style of knobs but it's possible that those have been replaced. We've still got the ABR-1 bridge, so that means it's still Kalamazoo production. We should have T-top pickups in this one. We do have the earlier style tuners, so maybe it's closer to 75. Looks like our nut's been replaced on this one. Ooh, some sort of a headstock repair. That's why this thing went so cheap. Other than that, looks like just some honest playware. I'd say the knobs have probably been replaced on that. Other than that, I would probably say a 75-ish. So that went for about right once you add buyer's premium. And here was a beautiful studio model. Only 800 bucks. If you can ever get a 90s white Les Paul studio with the ebony fretboard for like a thousand bucks, do it. You are never going to regret that decision. I love 90s studios. Now the white finished ones, you can go all the way until the 2000s and also have the ebony fretboards. But for me, something about the early 90s studios, they're just a little bit better. Now it looks like somebody's replaced a couple of our knobs on this one and it desperately needs cleaned. I can't quite read the serial number in this photo, and it's pretty worn down here, but trust me, these things are gigging machines. If I had to have a Les Paul that I needed to gig all across the country, an early 90s studio would be a very strong contender. But oh cool, that one's from 1994. If you thought it was 1998, just remember, there is no 400th day of the year. 1994 was the first time they introduced the year-year production number and then they brought it back in 2014 up until early 2019 and lastly here we've got a joe perry signature so this is the studio version there's also a custom shop i had one a long time ago definitely need to re-review one of those but what makes these studios so cool is the fact that they have a built-in wah circuit it's kind of like the sully erna with the built-in effect now, unfortunately, I've never had one that still had it in there or was still functioning. The problem with these is they're pretty expensive and they're basically just glorified studios with a flame top. Because they were specced without the binding, sure they get the cool moto pick guard, black hardware, and then you also get the Joe Perry signature down here, that's a decal. But these are really stripped down guitars. But they're unique. The 90s is the rebirth of signature guitars as far as giving other artists signature Les Pauls because the Les Paul is technically already a signature guitar to Les Paul himself. So the way a lot of people think of Gibson today, that all birthed in the 90s. And you gotta remember, that was within the Henry J era. So say whatever you want about the end of his reign. He and his team brought Gibson back to life. And that's kind of where we sit now with the new ownership of Gibson today. They're slowly bringing it back to life. Will they go off the deep end in a couple of years? I sure hope so, because that's when all the cool models start to happen. But as long as they don't start acquiring a whole bunch of other companies that take away their profitability, I think they'll be able to survive it and still have fun. But I think that's enough rambling for tonight, my friends. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.